Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we resume now with general questions. Question one, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to promote economic growth in the south of Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. The Scottish Government is committed to promoting economic growth in the south of Scotland. Uh, our substantial investment in infrastructure, regeneration and business support helps to deliver inclusive growth and economic resilience, creating and retaining jobs in communities across the area. We are building on our commitment to the area by establishing a new enterprise and skills vehicle for the south of Scotland, which will drive economic growth. Finlay Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. My colleagues and I have long campaigned for a South of Scotland enterprise agency, and this must be well-resourced, robust and an autonomous agency. Only with a fully autonomous board like that of the Highlands and Islands Enterprise will my constituents of Galloway and West and Fries fully benefit from the opportunities that such an organisation would present. Unlike this SNP government's obsession with centralisation, the Scottish Conservatives will always make the case that decision-making should be made as close to the source as possible. The Conservatives manifesto has made a commitment to bring forward a borderlands growth deal, including councils on both sides of the border, to help secure prosperity in southern Scotland. Does the Cabinet Secretary welcome such a proposal, which would bring much needed growth and investment to the southwest of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. I find it ironic that a party which is closing job centres across the country and closing military bases talks about other parties being centralising. Yeah. It's also true to say that the Borderlands Initiative, of course, was first proposed by the SNP government in 2013. It's also true to say that your constituents can rely on the fact that the Tories might talk about doing this. It's the SNP government that will establish a vehicle for, Scotland, uh, for the south of Scotland uh, through uh, economic uh, enterprise and skills review. So we are taking that action, as we've taken other actions, like the establishment of the Borders Rail, as we've taken action in terms of regeneration. It is our view that the uh, agency which is established in the south of Scotland should be one which is autonomous, as Finley Carson describes. I've given that uh, commitment uh, previously, that it will be analogous to that uh, for the Highlands and Islands uh, enterprise. But it's quite clear in this area, as in many others, it's the SNP that's delivering in these areas, where all the Tories have done uh, over many years, is talk about it. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Borderlands Initiative is being taken forward by Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish Borders Councils in Scotland, working with Carlisle, Cumbria, Northumberland Councils in England. But to date, there hasn't been a single penny from either the UK government or the Scottish Government, and it's been left to local authorities to pick up the bill, despite both governments again today claiming to support the Borderlands Initiative. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore tell us exactly what support the Scottish Government intends to provide for the development of a Borderlands growth deal, and is he aware of any funding whatsoever coming from the UK Government for this initiative? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I'm not aware uh, on the last point of any funding coming directly from the UK Government, although it is true to say that the Edinburgh City deal will include, the Edinburgh uh, region, City Region deal will include, of course, uh, Scottish Borders Council, so money will come both from the UK Government and from the Scottish Government in relation to that. Yes, we did establish uh, the Borderlands Initiative, and it was for local authorities to take these things forward. We would just be falling into the trap of being told that we're centralising if we were to decide exactly what initiatives should be taken forward. So we will rely upon the representations made to us and the proposals made to us by local authorities, and we will seek to support those. So it will depend exactly on what those uh, proposals are. But whether it's in terms of the Scottish Borders uh, uh, Council and the support they've had in terms of the Borders Rail or in the other infrastructure and regeneration investments we've made across the south of Scotland, increasing Dumfries and Galloway, the Scottish Government will be supporting local communities across this area and we urge the UK Government to do likewise. Question number two, Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government for what reason it does not keep minutes of all meetings between stakeholders and ministers. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. I can confirm the Scottish Government proactively publishes all ministerial engagements with information on the date, purpose and attendees and the subject of the engagement. Formal minutes are taken where there are discussions of on substantive government business where policy decisions arise or where there are significant action points. Neil Findlay. Why does the First Minister and other Cabinet Ministers meet with corporate, cor corporate lobbyists, including, uh, for example, uh, representatives of Charlotte Street Partners, uh, uh, someone who chairs the SNP's Growth Commission, Mr Andrew Wilson, but fails to publish any agenda or any minute or any record of this meeting and others? Does this not breach the Ministerial Code or does it breach the Civil Service Code? I think, um, to be clear, the government uh, takes minutes as appropriate in line with the, the ministerial code and in line with 
the civil service guidance, and, and that's, that, that's, that's what we do, and that's what we have always done. But, it, but it's also worth saying that this government is far more transparent than previous governments, and that this government, this government proactively, proactively publishes when those meetings are happening and where, where, where our meetings are happening. That's not something that happened um, under uh, previous administrations. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The lack of minute recording of key meetings, combined with journalists from across Scotland signing an open letter raising concerns about information requests being repeatedly delayed, emails asking for updates on answer requests uh, repeatedly ignored, this surely gives rise to the Scottish Government having a transparency problem? Minister. The, the Scottish Government takes our responsibility under FOI very seriously. Um, and, in, and in fact, um, the Scottish Government has a, a far better record than the UK Government at releasing oh. information. So, so where in 2016, where in 2016, 85% of valid responses um, requests resulted in information being released by the Scottish Government on a, in, on the similar basis in the UK, only 63% of requests resulted in information being being released. Presenting officer, the Scottish the Scottish um, FOI regime is far more robust than the regime that, that reflects elsewhere in the UK. And if the member wants to look at how we can provide more information to journalists, then perhaps he should be speaking to his colleagues down south, who rather than looking to how they can improve the FOI regime, are looking at how they can tighten up and make it more difficult for journalists and other members of the public to receive information. <laughs> Joanne Lamont. Can I just ask if the Minister has read the letter from the journalist criticising the government on FOI? And if not, maybe you can get back to me with a minute which proves that it was handed to you. This is really serious. It's unprecedented for journalists to feel obliged to produce such a letter. And will the Minister come back and give a more serious response to the challenges that that presents to us all? Minister. So I can confirm that I have um, read the letter and, um, and, I will, um, and we're, of course, looking at the matters. Um, one of the issues that the journalists ha have, have raised was in terms of, of, of time, timeliness and um, we are working with the Information Commissioner to improve our response times and, um, in, in response to that. But I, but I do think it, it's worth looking at the, at the facts of the matter. The facts of the matter is that we have a, a massively increasing number of FOIs that are being answered, more being answered on time than, than, than really ever before. In, in 2016, prior to this government, there were only 684 FOI responses answered on time. Last year, the last full year, this government answered 1,557 responses on time. So that's going from 61% of responses under the Labour Liberal administration up to 76% under this administration. That said, we are determined to continue to improve our performance and, and look at how we can make this government, which is already one of the most transparent governments in the world, even better. Question number three, Liz Smith to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to encourage young people to study medicine at university. Young people at school are provided with experiences and careers advice to raise awareness of a range of degree opportunities available. There are also targeted schools programmes to encourage young people into careers in health and medicine in particular. We provide additional funding through the Scottish Funding Council to universities to help improve access to high demand professions. There is the REACH programme linked to each medical school in Scotland to support young people from low progression schools who wish to study medicine. And in March this year, we also announced funding of £330,000 to deliver a pre-entry courses to medicine, which will be used to support secondary school students from socially deprived backgrounds to better prepare themselves for undergraduate medical education. Liz Smith. Uh, with regard to medical undergraduates, the Scottish Government announced uh, for this academic session an increase in 50 places. And I understand that there will be another 40 places for academic session 2018-19. But that still does not make up for the reductions over the previous 10 years, nor does it match the 25% increase that has been announced for south of the border. Given the current chronic shortage of GPs in Scotland, will the Minister tell Parliament what advice she has received from the medical undergraduate group? And does she believe that the capping system on places for domicile Scots is really working? Minister. 
Well, Liz Smith is correct to point to the increase of 50 medical undergraduate places uh, targeted at students from the most deprived areas. She'll also be very well aware of the workforce planning requirements that go in to the analysis before any decisions um, on medical um, uh, places are taken for universities. I do have to correct her about this, this cap for, for a university places for domiciled Scots. There is no cap on um, places. The setting of medical student places is based on the workforce pl planning needs of NHS Scotland, which I've previously mentioned. So whilst we set the annual intake into medicine, the selection and recruitment of individual students admitted to study medicine is of course a matter for individual universities, which Liz Smith correctly points out to me on every occasion, universities are independent organisations and it is not for the government to decide which places are given to students within each year. Yep. Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support and encouragement it is given to universities to offer places to study medicine to students from less affluent backgrounds. Minister. Well, I have already uh, mentioned in reply to Liz Smith around the, the 50 medical undergraduate places for the 2016 intake, which universities will use to support the widening access aims of the government. We also have the pre-medical entry programme, which will be used to support secondary school students from socially deprived backgrounds to better prepare themselves for undergraduate medical education. And the REACH programme um, established to link with each medical school in Scotland will ensure that once again we go out um, through this outreach programme to aim the S4 to S6 pupils, including Edinburgh and the Lothians, who have a slow progression into higher education and medical careers, to give them a greater insight and encourage them um, to, to and offer support in their application process. Question number four, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many professional veterinary bodies have indicated support for its legislative proposal to allow the amputation of tails in healthy puppies. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Only one response from professional veterinary bodies was received to the public consultation held between 10th February and 3rd May 2016. This was a combined response from the British Veterinary Association and the British Small Animal Veterinary Association. Those organisations were not in favour of the proposal to permit the shortening of the tails of Spaniel and Hunt Point Retriever puppies where a vet believes they are likely to be used as a working dog and risk serious tail injury in later life. The Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons did not tender a response to the consultation. Mark Roskell. Well, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very straight and very revealing answer. The reason, Cabinet Secretary, that organisations like the British Veterinary Association are not supporting the statutory instrument is because it's fundamentally anti-science. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, why does it make sense to amputate the tails of hundreds and hundreds of puppies at under five days old just to avoid the amputation of one tail in an adult working dog? Yes. Well, I look forward to uh, appearing before the committee next Tuesday morning. Uh, the uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee is in the progress of uh, dealing with this particular uh, statutory instrument. Um, while uh, the veterinary organisations that I uh, named uh, don't agree with uh, uh, the proposal, it is, of course, the situation that prevails south of the border. And the member, I think, is probably very well aware that uh, not all vets are of exactly the same opinion on this matter. Um, we did do uh, research. There was research published in 2014 uh, which persuaded, persuaded us that in limited circumstances, covering only two breeds of dogs and dealing only with the one-third tail tip uh, of the animals, this was an appropriate way forward. Uh, and as I said, I look forward to appearing before the committee on Tuesday morning. Question number five, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect low and mid middle income earners from negative growth. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish economy has been resilient in 2016, growing 0.4%, despite continued headwinds, uh, headwinds from the North Sea industry and the uncertainty caused by the EU referendum vote. Scotland's economic fundamentals are strong, unemployment is down and employment is up in 2016. We secured more foreign direct investment projects than any other part of the UK outside London for the fifth year in a row. And independent forecasters are predicting growth in the Scottish economy in 2017 and 2018. As well as our actions to support economic growth, we're continuing to help low and middle income earners 
For instance, we have frozen the basic rate of income tax in the current tax year and are committed to no increases in the basic rate subject to parliamentary approval for this term of this parliament. We have also capped increases to the council tax, 3%, and we have made it a requirement in our public sector pay policy for employers to pay the living wage. And we are continuing with our policy of no compulsory redundancies within the public sector. So the real risk to Scotland's economy comes from a hard Brexit and the continuation of Westminster's austerity agenda. Jimmy Green. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be pleased to know that actually it's the Conservative Government that has taken 113,000 Scots out of tax altogether at the lower end. Uh, it, also last, uh, we're, we're finding out just yesterday that Ernst & Young's uh, Scottish Item Club report uh, is quoted as saying that the Scottish economy is stuck in the slow lane. Uh, last quarter's GDP figures show that we're already halfway to a recession and we're shortly to find out if that is the case. Given that all of this has happened under this SNP's watch, will the Cabinet Secretary take personal responsibility for the stagnation in the Scottish economy and will he today apologise to the people of Scotland for it? Cabinet Secretary. I think that uh, I think, uh, Jamie Green should apologise for once again talking down Scotland and undermining, and as do all Conservatives, uh, undermining uh, Scotland when it comes to trying to attract foreign direct investment and other investors to, to live, work and invest uh, within Scotland, in which we've had a great track record. Uh, Jamie Green also mentions taxation. It's really interesting, the, the Tory party manifesto, or what's left of it last that I checked, it doesn't refer to tax rates. And we all know that the Tories propose tax cuts for the richest whilst hammering the poorest in our society. That's what the Tories are all about. But Scotland's economic fundamentals are strong. We are seeing employment going up, uh, unemployment uh, going down, improved performance on productivity, better in comparative terms than the rest of the UK, more registered businesses, more investment, research and development and record achievement on our exports. So we have an economic strategy that will support the Scottish economy at the same time as the UK government uh, through the Tories and the Scottish Tories is trying to undermine it and they should take their responsibility seriously as being a uh, part of the current governance of Scotland and the economic uh, strategy. Maybe that will change uh, shortly, but the Tories should take some responsibility for their inaction to support the Scottish economy since their time in office. Question number six, Joanne Lamond. To ask the Scottish Government what funding it has provided to third sector organisations to tackle homelessness in Glasgow since 2007. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Since 2007, the Scottish Government has funded a range of third sector homelessness organisations through the Housing Voluntary Grant Scheme and other schemes, with over £11 million made available to homelessness projects across Scotland, including Glasgow. In 2017-18, this includes continued funding for Glasgow Homelessness Network, provided since 2008, to help improve the involvement of homeless people in the delivery of services across Scotland. The vast majority of funding provided by the Scottish Government to tackle homelessness is through a block grant to each local authority who have the statutory obligation to address homelessness in their area and who will use these resources to fund third sector organisations involved in tackling homelessness. Despite ongoing cuts to the Scottish budget by the UK Government, Glasgow City Council continue to receive a fair share of this overall funding of over £10.4 billion in 2017-18 which means Glasgow will receive £1,369 million. Joanne Lamond. Well, I don't know what the Minister's definition of fair is, but it's certainly not fair to Glasgow what has happened over the last period at the hands of your government. But I'm sure the Minister will acknowledge that the scourge of homelessness in modern Scotland shames us all and trust that he recognises that it is important to tackle homelessness not just by building more houses, and sustainable houses, but by understanding the causes of homelessness, whether this be abuse, addiction or family breakdown. Would the Minister agree with me that the role of charities and homeless organisations is absolutely crucial in ensuring the right support for those vulnerable to homelessness and to help sustain them in tenancies? And can I ask him what assessment he has made of the impact of sustained cuts to local government on the ability of these organisations to deliver the services that homeless people so desperately need and deserve. Minister. 
Thank you, President Officer. I, I note that um, uh, Ms Lamont hasn't taken cognizance of part of my question was, was, was the fact that the Scottish Government's budget has been cut year on year by the UK Government. Uh, and uh, we have done our very best to ensure that we provide monies for frontline services to local authorities. Can I say, um, President Officer, that we have very strong rights uh, to housing for homeless households and our recent focus on the prevention of homelessness through the housing options approach has led to consistent falls in homelessness applica applications in Glasgow, including from those that have been rough sleeping. I certainly recognise the value of third sector organisations uh, in delivering services uh, and the council which receives funding to address homelessness from the Scottish Government are best placed working in partnership with local third sector organisations and other partners such as health to make decisions on the appropriate level of funding to organisations based on the local profile of homelessness. I welcome the fact that the new SNP administration and the Council have recently stated their intention to hold a homelessness summit in the city, including with partners from the third sector and housing associations to agree a joint approach to tackling this issue. I only wish that Glasgow had done this previously under the previous Labour administration. Yeah, yeah. Question number seven, Dean Lockhart. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish the findings of Phase 2 of the Enterprise and Skills Review. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the final report on Phase 2 of the Enterprise and Skills Review is to be published in late June. Detail regarding the new strategic board, which will coordinate the work of the agencies, that's Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council, was announced on the 30th of March. Significant progress has also been made across all other work streams, including recommendations regarding the new data and analytical function, an improved approach to the development of regional partnerships, multiple actions pertaining to enterprise and business support, innovation and internationalisation, the latter linked to the trade and investment strategy. Specific plans for the alignment of skills planning and a full programme are underway regarding the 50 to 24 learner journey. The review will now enter its implementation phase with the report outlining initial delivery plans for projects. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response and I look forward to the publication of Phase 2. With the Scottish economy heading towards recession, enterprise policy will play an increasingly important part in turning the economy around. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore confirm how many businesses in Scotland have received assistance under the growth scheme announced by the Scottish Government last September as a central part of their programme for government and what level of financial assistance has been granted to businesses so far under this scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I note first of all the increasing willingness of the Tories to try and talk up a recession in Scotland? This is beyond being an opposition party. This is deliberately trying to undermine. Now, I've had this from the CBI and other uh, business organisations saying they're sick to the back teeth of Conservatives talking down the economy in Scotland. Uh, can I also say that uh, in relation to the Scottish Growth Scheme announcement we made, that, uh, we made on that uh, imminently before uh, recess and full details will be made known at that time. It is also important to recognise, of course, that in the Scottish economy, the Tories have boasted about holding most of the major tools in which to influence the economy. Why do they never ask themselves? If they think the economy is doing so badly, what the culpability is of the Tory government there at Westminster, who control the majority of functions. Despite, despite the neglect of the Tory government at Westminster, we have seen record FDI investment once again this year. We have seen lower unemployment in Scotland than we have in the rest of the UK. And yet the UK government has an increasing balance of payments deficit, has a £1.8 trillion debt, adding £100, million, 100 billion pounds every year since the Tories came into power. I know whose record is more impressive in terms of the Scottish economy, and it's not the UK government. That concludes general questions. We turn now to culture, tourism and external affairs.